Hi, my name is Thomas Johnson, and I'm the founder and CEO of Get Up to Get Fit Wellness Coaching Concierge. I'm also a C-suite advisor and investor, and you're listening to the How May I Serve You podcast, where I'm constantly on the quest to surround myself with the best coaches while learning how to better serve our executive clientele by asking them, how may I serve you? Today's show is sponsored by Get Up and Get Fit. Get Up and Get Fit will be providing students with textbooks and school supplies in Cambodia in honor of our guest today, as well as our philanthropic mission to impact at least 50,000 people per year. And today's guest is Delena Bradley. Hello, Delena, how are you doing? Hello, Thomas, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me today. Awesome, awesome, you're very, very welcome. So Delena Bradley is a job interview coach and career marketing expert who's helped hundreds of job seekers internationally gain confidence and get the jobs they want faster via her one-on-one -on -one coaching practice and through, through her group presentations, webinars, and as a podcast guest. Okay. With a background in corporate communications, working for three global companies, executive recruiting and outplacement, Delena is a certified employment interview professional. CEIP and is a member of Career Directors International and the Professional Association of Resume Writers and Career Coaches. Okay, okay. <laughs> welcome, Delena. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you again. <laughs> All right. So, Delena, I want us, um, myself and the audience, we want to know a little bit more about you. Okay. So, let's start off with your background. Let's go back, all the way back. So, who are you? Where are you from? Oh, how far back would you like me to go? <laughs> go <on>. Let's go. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, as far as where I'm from, I'm a native Oregonian. Okay. Uh, I was actually raised in a very rural area. I kind of like to play the game of how small was your graduating class? Because usually I always win. Uh, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I graduated with a class of 40 people. From, wow. from high school. But anyway, uh, that's way back. Uh, I've been primarily based in Portland, Oregon, and I had a five-year stint in the uh, San Francisco Bay area. Okay. That is where I was working uh, for those global companies you mentioned when you mm -hmm. read my bio earlier. I worked for companies. It, I started out in corporate communications and I worked for three global companies, including Hyatt Hotels, Nestle, and a large uh, commercial insurance brokerage. Okay. Those were the companies. And then uh, I pivoted to executive recruiting, came back to Portland, and I want to be back with closer to family. Mm -hmm. And so I had the opportunity. I, it was just a kind of a fluke. I was networking and somebody said, have you ever considered executive recruiting? And I had not, mm -hmm. uh, but I thought about it and it was time for a change. It was try time to do something different. And so I began uh, recruiting for mainly director level and above positions okay. across all functional areas of expertise and industries for a boutique firm here in Portland. Okay. And then uh, I took a, a short sabbatical to kind of get my family launched. And then I, when that happened, when, the, when they were launched, <laughs> I decided uh, to hang my own shingle. And so I combined my corporate communications background and my recruiting expertise and uh, went into helping people get jobs faster through really effective initially career marketing materials okay so i was i was focused on writing uh resumes linkedin profiles bios you name it mm -hmm. and then after a while it was so isolating after that initial intake that i had with clients which was my favorite part <laughs> not the writing itself, even though I was very good at it. Yeah, the and, uh, I decided about five years ago to pivot to coaching. Oh, and five years then, ago. Okay. Yeah. And so since then I have been, I've developed a niche in the career sphere for mm -hmm. primarily interview preparation for executives. 
Okay, okay, that's great right there. So it seems like you you went through a, a series of events and and you that led you to where you are right now with, with your with the career coaching. Um, I want to go further back into your childhood one more time because I, I like to kind of dig, dig, uh, you know, dig to really find out about you know nurture your nurturing um situation, like how you grew up, what influenced you. So being in Portland, Oregon, right? I mean, uh-huh. I've I've not been in I don't I don't believe I've been in Portland, have I? Perhaps I'm not sure. Well, um, <laughs> so, mm-hmm. how were things out there? Like, how, how did you grow up? Because you mentioned growing up in a rural area. Were you an outdoorsy kid? Were you were you very curious, like getting into trouble? Like, talk to me about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, uh, it's interesting because I grew up on a wheat ranch, oh, a oh, pretty wow. large wheat operation, wheat and barley. Okay in Eastern Oregon, which is very different from Portland. It's a very, very different, it's a high, more high desert. Okay. And, and of course there's a uh, dry land wheat operations all over. <laughs> uh, so it was very, you know, everybody who was there did the same thing. They were all farmers. And okay. uh, I spent my entire time outside. I was outside all of the time. I had horses. So I was always on on horseback, often by myself, just sort of in my own imaginary world, (laughs) Uh, riding horses. We had dogs, cats. So I'm a huge animal person and I still am and still have a couple of dogs. I've always had dogs. And that really shaped who I was in terms of my work ethic, Mm -hmm. because I don't think I know harder working people than the people who live where I came from in Sherman yeah. County. These people work constantly and, and your work is your life there. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's very much a lifestyle. There's not a distinction. Okay. Like we try to, we talk about balance a lot in our, in our lives when, when we're in cities, working in cities and mm-hmm. that sort of thing, especially with COVID people are, are rebalancing their, career with their life but you know on the ranch you just don't get yeah yeah because you have to tend to the animals um you have to tend to the land and then you also have the crops right that's right you know um i could attest i mean i was not raised on a farm but i was not born here i was born in liberia um a country in west africa and after the civil war I, i went through a civil war so after the civil war um my grandmother she um basically created like gardens right a whole bunch of like crops and, and gardens with, within her on her land and my uncles my aunts my cousins because we were living like a, a community more of, of a condo a condo style um um like living quarter so i do understand how tedious <laughs> it is uh, when it comes to tending the, the land um the crops the animals it's it's nonstop. It's nonstop, and this is what you grew up around. And I bet your work ethic. You, you learn hard work at an early age because there's no way you could hang out and live a leisure lifestyle when there when a chores that needs to be done. <laughs> That's right. I'm curious, what crops did your family grow? So they pretty much grew um almost everything. Um, so I mean okra, peppers, uh, you know, spinach, and um, variation. But it was it it was just. We grew almost everything besides rice, besides rice, right? Um, so yeah, I, I grew up around there for for a few years. So and we, we had chicken, we had a few other um, cattle and goats and things of that nature. So it was it was interesting. I should cheat the chickens when, when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they can be they can be kind of mean. Yes, yeah, especially especially that. the roosters. The roosters they're freaking um, devious. <laughs> yeah. So um, so growing up growing up in Poland, right? Um, you you. You gradually um, you moved you moved away from Poland. You you went towards you said San Francisco. Yes. You went to San Francisco. How how was how was the change? I know that was, that was a big a big cultural shock, right? From Portland to San Fran. Like talk to me about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, Portland was sort of in between. So there was the ranch in Eastern yeah. Oregon in Sherman County. Came to Portland. That's where I went to. Uh, University of Portland. Okay. And that was kind of a nice transition because it was a smaller school, 3,500 undergrad, something like that it was a nice 
transition from being in the middle of nowhere and mm -hmm. then yes to san francisco where it was an incredibly uh, diverse uh, population of uh people the city was mm -hmm. so i i like to describe it as electric yeah the, the city had electricity and i i loved every minute of it <laughs> San Francisco is a, a wonderful place and also a place when you're starting out in your career and, you know, you don't have um, a lot of responsibilities necessarily out, outside of work. It was a great place to be. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right. So now let's talk about your transition. Right. All right. You um, you basically stumble upon it because somebody said somebody recommended career um it's a career coaching all right why were you networking when this happened well okay so i left out i left out a little bit of a detail earlier so talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean i i since we're getting a little more personal yeah i decided to come back to portland yes to be closer to family but i will tell you the it's no secret that living in the Bay Area is prohibitively expensive to get into a house or that kind of thing. And so at the time, my husband and I were newly married and we could foresee that if we wanted to buy something, we would have to live <laughs> an hour or more outside of the city. Mm -hmm. And so Portland at the time was a lot more affordable. And, and also we had all of our family was here. So came back to Portland and both of us just quit our jobs. We oh, were wow. able to continue to consult with our okay. respective companies, which was great. And uh, we were able to find a home and everything. But I joined a small uh, PR agency that okay. was vastly different than working for the large companies that I mentioned earlier. And it was, that was a shock to the system okay. because there were, there were no resources. There was no IT department. There was no training there. It, you know, it was just dive right in to the fire. And uh, it was a, a small group of people mm -hmm. and everybody just was heads, heads down working. There wasn't a lot of collaboration there anyway mm. it was a very different culture i was not happy okay. i was not happy and i felt like there was a real mismatch in the skills that you know i had it i had this corporate communications background i was focused a lot on employee communication mm -hmm. and executive communication and this was very focused on media relations and just getting press on, on behalf of our clients. It was kind of a sales job because you were on the cool. phone with reporters a lot and everything. Anyway, it was just not a good match. And uh, so I knew I needed to make a change. And so I was in a I went to a job seeker group. OK. Okay. That is where the idea sharing happened. <laughs> that is where the person said, have you thought of executive recruiting? Okay. Okay. There you go. All right. And th thanks for that background story because it helps to create a better context. But you know what? This is why I tell people sometimes being uncomfortable is the best thing that could happen to you because it forces you to look for other ways and means to get out of that situation. Right. And you went through a situation that you were not found of, right? You were not, you were not happy in your situation. In, in that environment and you decide to seek something else, seek opportunity. And what happened? You stumble upon the, the job seeker, seeker group and somebody within that job seeker group recommended this position to you or this job to you. And now you're successful. You're doing a phenomenal job. <laughs> all right. So, yeah. all right. So that's, that's a great, great background story. So, you know, I've interviewed plenty of, of coaches, right? Um, and I know there are many types of coaches and different type of coaching style. Um, so what what is your your coaching style? Because as a you know, your career your career coach, um, what's your style of coaching? What's your approach? My approach is very practical okay. and very hands on. I this term this phrase almost seems overused. 
meet meet the person where they are. You hear that all the time. But I think that it's overused because it is spot on. And so I usually have people come to me for one of three reasons. Okay. One is they have not interviewed in a really long time. Another reason is they just have a really hard, they know they're self-aware enough. They have a really hard time communicating their value, even though they're exceptional at what it is they do. And the third reason is they have been interviewing and interviewing and interviewing, and they're not closing the deal for some, for whatever reason. Mm. So those are the reasons they come to me. Okay. And so depending on the, their reason for coming to me, I will adapt my approach. Yeah. yeah. If a person's been interviewing over and over and over and over and over again, they probably have, I mean, sometimes we need to work on their messaging. Absolutely. A strategy <laughs> session is in order. I always have a strategy session. Okay. But sometimes people say, can you just, can we just practice some more? I just feel like I need more practice. And so I will balance the strategy with the, the amount of strategy with the amount of practice based on where they're coming from. But to answer your question, my approach is very customized, very practical. What I do is so specialized and I have a very time tested approach. But if they say to me, I really want to work on these five things, then we will work on those five things. And of course, I will, I will augment that mm -hmm. as, as necessary, but that's, that's the approach. It's okay, uh, right. so very hands-on, very customized. You, you meet them where they're at. And that term, you know, even though you mentioned that it's overused, but that, that's, how that's how it should be, right? Um, a coach is supposed to meet the client where they're at. Then, you know, of course, we evaluate them and then reverse engineer all that good stuff but you, you have to start off with where the client is at before you even go any further so i agree with you customization 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 after meeting up where they're at <laughs> that's right yes indeed so um okay all right what one thing you, you mentioned you um as you as you were explaining yourself you mentioned sometimes the the the, the client wants to practice and practice and practice, right? Um, but this is what I've realized over the years. Sometimes people don't understand that you can work hard, right? We we all work hard for the most part. But if you don't have the right guidance in the right direction, that hard work could end up turning into frustration. You know? Mm -hmm. So you could beat the hammer, beat the hammer, beat the hammer. But <laughs> if you're hitting the hammer, the, if you're hitting the hammer wrongly or hitting in the nail um in the wrong direction then you're not going to progress in that's the right, right direction that's right so that's why <laughs> honest practical feedback is in order yes that's indeed. and i have said usually when i have the discovery call with my prospective client i will say i am going to be kind not going to be mean, but I am going to be honest because you're paying for honesty. Yes, indeed. Because the problem with interviewing, if you're not closing the deal, even if you ask for feedback, it's not always going, you're not always going to get feedback, A, not any feedback, or the feedback you do receive is often watered down <laughs> and disingenuous. Mm -hmm. And that's why people come to me yeah. because they want me to say it straight and I will. And I have said things that maybe are a little uncomfortable for both me and the person. And I am diplomatic and professional about it, mm -hmm. but that's what people are paying me for. Yeah. They pay for results, right? I mean, if, if, if these folks, they want results. They wouldn't have hired a career, um, a career marketing expert, right? So they're paying for results. So 
You know, it's up to them to put their ego and pride aside and to accept it. Even though sometimes it's hard, especially for higher performers. <laughs> but um, exactly. that's, the, that's 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 the trade off right there. <laughs> that's right. We're looking for transformation. Yes, As indeed. you know, in the coaching business in general, the person is looking for change and transformation or at least elevation of some situation they it's it's about the results which aka transformation yeah you're absolutely right so what's your target clientele hmm. who's the target, I say, who's the target clientele rather right i work primarily with senior level professionals and executives okay um, people who are well established in their careers they've been in they've been working for a while and i do work with people across industries and areas of expertise i tend to see more people in sales marketing operations hr finance a lot of finance people engineers as well Okay. Uh, just people in it, often in senior or leadership roles in those areas. Got it. Okay. So your, your main focus um, is on corporate. So you work with, um, I should say, C suite, the C suite individuals. So you, you'll work with any entrepreneurs, right? Just C suite? Sometimes I work with entrepreneurs, but a lot of times they're not necessarily looking for role, looking to work for someone else. Yeah. And and, and uh, not certainly not C suite exclusively, although I do work with C level people. Okay. I just, just had a session yesterday with a C level person, uh, but I would say director, VP. Yeah. So senior so senior so director. Mid, mid to high. So it's a mid to high level. Got you. Okay. Right. Perfect. All right. Um, now, if somebody, I want you to put yourself in a prospect shoe now. Okay. Now, now you're going to switch shoes. Okay. Okay. So if someone, if a prospect were looking for a coach, what traits yeah. would you advise for them to look for? Oh, <laughs> that is a really good question. I would say I would be, if I were looking for a coach, I would be looking for somebody who is knowledgeable, who is experienced. They've been doing this for a while, especially if I'm an executive. I I don't want someone who's just starting their business or if they have started their business, maybe they still do have experience. And so they're just forming their business model. That That would be okay. But experienced and knowledgeable in the area in which I would be hiring them to do, I would be looking, we talked about meeting somebody where they are. So does, is, is this person going to do thorough intake and okay. really dig in and find out where I am so that they can customize and, and they're, so the flexibility and the uh, willingness to customize and uh, flex out their process if if necessary. The other thing I would look for is chemistry. Chemistry with the person. Do you, do you vibe with them? Because I'll tell you, if somebody calls me, and I always have to remember, they're probably calling other coaches too. If they find that they just hit it off with someone else better for whatever reason, mm -hmm. great. That is great because my, I, I truly want everyone to be successful in their career. And if they feel that working with somebody else is going to progress their, their interests and their experience and elevate their interview performance better than me, great. I would love to be able to work with everybody who calls me. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't always happen. Yeah. And I don't take it personally. It's okay. Yeah. So have you ever had the situation a situation where you had to um refer a prospect to another coach because it just wasn't a good fit? All the time. Okay. I have a fabulous network. Mm. And at you know, at first when I was in my business, kind of new in my business, yeah, I didn't like referring people because I needed to <laughs> no, work. I appreciate your honesty. You you are the first person that that's actually admitted that. I appreciate your really? honesty. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I didn't want to. I didn't, sure, I wanted to hold on to everybody, but you're really doing a disservice to both of you. Yes, indeed. If you have that approach, I have learned there is plenty of business to go around. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people in the world <laughs> to work with, and you develop your own networks, and it's fine. And so, rather than see people as competition, other coaches as competition. Mm -hmm. I look at them as collaborators and peers and all the time, every single week, I am referring them to people who I know will serve them better. And that can be, in my case, uh, it's typically people who are in exploration mode. Okay. They are just not sure what the next step is. Mm -hmm. And I've learned about myself I like working with people who have a very clear target, yeah. a clear target. And then I'm going to take them by the arm and let's go. I am go. much better at that than what are all the possibilities. And plus, I feel like it's a big responsibility to make suggestions to people. Well, try <laughs> this, this or this, because well, yeah. that doesn't work out. Right. So. In, you know what? Um, I love the fact that you understand your strengths and you understand what you like and what you don't like, right? You're not forcing, you're not forcing it. <laughs> you're not forcing exactly. it. You're, you're focusing on your, um, your strength, right? Your, your realm of influence, you know, your, your go-to and, and as it, as it should be, you know? So, um, now let's dive into storytelling time because now <laughs> this, 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 this is the, the chance you get to shine. Okay. <laughs> so, I want you to give me a two to three minute success story where you took a perspective, uh, a, a, a client, right? And you got them past a hurdle and you took them to success from that hurdle towards success. This is going to be good practice for me because I tell my clients a two minute response time is okay. kind of the, the best practice. It's the rule of thumb in interviewing. So. Let's see if I can do it. I am thinking specifically of a an executive who came to me after she had she was earlier on in the pro process of very senior level product marketing executive, and she had had kind of her first rounds of interviews and just was not sticking you know she she wasn't sticking it there she wasn't getting offers and she couldn't figure out why because she was pedigreed you know she had a great academic background had worked for fantastic companies she was in software and so she came to me and just was like i can't i can't put my finger on what's going on nobody will give me the feedback i'm super common and i said okay let's go so we went through my process and we went through our strategy session and I realized right away what, what, what was wrong. And what was happening is she was, when I would ask her a question, a behavioral question, she would speak in broad generalizations oh. about her approach, her accomplishments. It would be highly generalized. And what she wasn't doing was giving very specific examples. So mm -hmm. for instance, if, if, if I would say, what's your leadership style, she'd say, you know, I'm very inclusive leader. I'm a servant leader. I really believe in developing people. And, you know, I've gotten really great. Re, uh, I've, I've, I've developed great teams over the years. People get promoted and, and are very successful because of my leadership. And that's great. So now say, for example, yeah, and tell a story and be specific. That is the single biggest thing is people are way too general and not specific enough because you have to paint a picture. You have to connect the dots for your interviewer so that they can begin to visualize you in that role. So exactly. we worked on that. Mm -hmm. We developed a portfolio of eight plus stories that she could tell and plug in at any given time because all you need to know is okay 
they're asking about leadership or they're asking about strategy. If you have ready a few examples already, you can just plug it in because some people get very overwhelmed with what's every possible question that could run my way and I need to have a specific answer. No, you only have to have a handful of really, really good stories. So that's what we did. We came up with the stories. She was really generating a lot of activity, interview activity because of her pedigree and her background. And so she was continuing to interview as we worked together. And I will tell you, it was night and day. And suddenly she was juggling three offers. And Ooh. so my, <laughs> then my coaching became uh, helping her with her salary negotiation, okay. which is also a big part of what I do. And making sure that we were not leaving any money on the table. And she was making multiple six figures uh, with her base salary and then a really great package in addition to that. Uh, it was it was a, a night and day transformation. There you go. The power of the power of specific storytelling, like being precise with your storytelling, being strategic with your storytelling, you know. Um, it's amazing because from being brought in, being everywhere, you was able to have her pinpoint her focus by telling a story, right? Because we all love me. I personally love stories, right? And the majority of people love stories. This is why we watch movies, listen to podcasts, read books because of storytelling. And you did a phenomenal job with helping her to understand the importance of storytelling. So kudos to you, Delena. <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, but here's the thing. The people who come to me are exceptional and they have it in them. It's there. Mm -hmm. It is there. They just need a little bit of help surfacing them and getting the messaging down because they'll say, they'll say to me, they're so grateful. Thank you so much. Or you helped make me look so good, which I appreciate. And sure, I'll take a little bit of the credit. But I always say to them, it's you came with all of this. You came with all of this fantastic experience and ability to do the job. I'm just helping you package it and present it. Yes, indeed. And that's what that's what makes the, the that's what separates the elite coaches from the mediocre ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So Delena, are you currently working on any new projects that you could share with us and new, new programs, books? Talk to me. Funny you should mention that. I am working on an online course. Okay. And it is, it's in development. I look forward to launching it late spring. So end of April, 1st of May on interviewing, ele elevating your interview skills so that those people who may not have the time uh, to, to have a few sessions with me or maybe they live across time zones or what have you, it, it makes my approach and process more accessible to a broader audience. So I'm going to bring uh, that to fruition shortly. And I am going to continue to I, I post videos on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, and then on my website, I have a blog and videos and whatnot. So I will continue to share best practices via LinkedIn, via my website, via, via my group presentations. Awesome. Awesome. Everyone that's listening and watching this right now, make sure to go on Delena's rally LinkedIn. Actually, before, before I even mention this, where can the audience <laughs> find you? I mean, if someone were to inquire about your services or just want to connect with you because you are such an amazing person, where can they find you, Delina? I love that question, Thomas, and you are on the right track. LinkedIn is a really great, great place to find me. I welcome people to connect and follow me on LinkedIn. It's Delina Bradley, and you can see the spelling uh, on the on the caption here. Uh, Delina Bradley, and then my website, delinabradley.com. Okay. So, the, so the, Delina, I'm just going to have you spell your name because uh, the uh, the podcast is going to be on. Oh, that's right. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, it's D-A-L-I-N-A-B-R-A-D-L-E-Y. 
E N A B R A D L E Y. There you go. There you go. So Delena, thank you for coming on today's episode of How May I Serve You. I love your story. I love your energy. And I and I love um the fact that you are you're hungry and you're passionate about this, you know. So I'm going to ask you one last question before we wrap this up. And that's how may I serve you, Delena? Thomas, you have served me already. It's just been such a pleasure to meet and talk with and learn more about you. And by being on your podcast today, I know that you have served more people, but I would just say, you know, please continue to keep me in mind. Please continue to stay in touch because this has been fantastic. So that's, that's it. Oh, awesome. Awesome. And I shout, right? Because uh, I like to connect with good people. All right. It feeds my soul. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, indeed. So to all of our listeners and viewers, thank you for lending us your ears and your eyeballs. And make sure to tune in to next week's episode. All right. Stay true to yourself. Be blessed. And we're out. Later. Bye-bye.